Welcome, please, to all of you on behalf of Griffin and King and Charlie Hutton. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch and you could move around without too much hassle. If the fire alarm, alarm goes off, then see you all in the car park, but I'm not expecting that. Um, if you could please turn your mobiles to silent or off, that would be greatly appreciated. Has anyone objections to photos or filming, please? Raise your hands. If you raise your hands, just leave the room. No, not really. <laughs> okay, I want to share this with you. It's a quote from Anna Thunder, if anybody's heard of her. I like trains. I like the rhythm. And I like the freedom of being suspended between two places. All anxieties of purpose taken care of. For this moment I know where I'm growing. And where are we going this afternoon? Our journey begins. Please extend an extremely warm welcome to our train driver, Tim Caulfield, Managing Director of Griffin and King. Right, thank you. Get rid of that. Um, now I've been told I've got to wear this hat, but it will, believe me, it will be coming off. I think, uh, I think Richard looks uh, amazingly like uh, Blakey off, off the buses. <laughs> I mean, maybe if you could just, just, just stand up, Richard, and just say after me, I hate you, Butler. <laughs> go on, go on, go on, go on. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll try that again later, I think. It sounds like good fun. Um, anyway, I'll get rid of this, I think. So, um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you all. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the event so far. As you probably know, my name's Tim Caulfield. I'm Managing Director of Griffin & King. I'm a Chartered Accountant, Insolvency Practitioner, and Law Graduate. And after qualifying many years ago, I spent around 20 years advising business owners about how to run profitable businesses and in more recent years I've specialised in rescue and recovery and debt advice. And Griffin and King are specialists in all aspects of business rescue and recovery including personal and corporate insolvency, nothing else. We don't have an accounts department, we don't have an audit department, we don't have a specialist tax department and we certainly don't do loans. We get introduced to our clients at the most difficult stage of their lives. Our clients tell us that we show empathy, compassion, consideration and above all professionalism to guide them through a very difficult period. But don't take my word for that. Have a look at our website and see the testimonials from our clients yourselves. And here's a couple of recent ones. Okay, so why are we here today? Most of you either advise business owners or individuals in one capacity or another, or you're in business yourself. This talk will give you a flavour of what we do and how we can help you to help your clients like we did with Ian and Bill. So, that brings me to today's talk where we'll be covering a liquidation journey. And this is a true story of a fairly complicated case that we've dealt with in the last couple of years. It'll highlight the technical differences between various insolvency appointments that most business professionals don't come across. And not that I'm expecting any sympathy, it'll show the everyday risks that an insolvency practitioner has to take in doing his job and how that can help those people and businesses that are caught up in an insolvency position. So the specific areas we'll be looking at today are what's a compulsory liquidation, what's the difference between a compulsory liquidation and a creditor's voluntary liquidation, what sort of things does a liquidator actually do? What does a receiver do? And who's he acting for? What's the difference between an LPA receiver and a fixed charge receiver? In what circumstances is it likely that the res a receiver will be appointed? And the talk will take about 20 minutes. 
Okay, so this is a compulsory liquidation. It's a story about a compulsory liquidation. I could have called it very, very complicated without not inconsiderable risk for the IP limited. But that's a bit of a mouthful. So I thought I'd just refer to it as the company, and that's what we'll do. So the outline of the company were these. These were the basic facts. The company dealt in scrap cars, lots of scrap cars on site, and the company traded alongside a sole trade of one of the directors. And by that, I mean the two businesses, that is the sole trader and the limited company, each owned separate pieces of land alongside each other from which they traded. Not jointly, but separate, about 40% owned by the company and around 60% owned by the sole trade. So the, and the total site was around 20 acres. There was significant bank borrowing by the company, which was secured. And there were four directors. There was Chris, who was also the proprietor of the sole trade, his wife Bev, their son Arnold, and Bob, an outside invest investor. And around 18 months ago, I had a call from Bob, who had been a client of Griffin and King when we were a general practice. And he knew that we now specialised in insolvency. And Bob told me that he'd invested around £150,000 into the company about five years ago, and he also became a director at the same time. And Bob's a wealthy businessman with quite a few business interests, so he'd left the family directors to manage the business. And Bob went on to explain. The trade had declined for numerous reasons. The directors had failed to move with the times. Chris, who was well into his 70s, was suffering with illness issues and not able to cope. Bev hadn't really got a clue. Arnold wasn't able to step up. The accounting records weren't maintained, and yes, we've, we've heard it all before, haven't we? And Chris was made bankrupt around six months before, and his estate was being dealt with by the official receiver. An HMRC had issued a winding up petition against the company and a winding up order had been made by the court around 14 days ago. The official receiver had spoken to Bob as the major creditor and asked if he had any preference as to the IP, that's the insolvency practitioner, who, which IP should be appointed and he proposed, he proposed us. And Bob explained to me that the official receiver had also spoken to HMRC who had no objection to us being appointed either. But he didn't really know anything more. So, I called the official receiver straight away, and he told me everything he knew, which didn't take very long at all. And what people don't know, what most people don't know about the official receiver, is that they just want to get cases off their desks as quickly as possible. They often don't know all the details and are inclined to miss the odd bank charge or value of it. And without putting too fine a point on it, that can be quite important. And it took the official receiver about 10 minutes to explain everything he knew to me. And this is what he told me. There were around 10 employees. He didn't know what was happening with the trade. Chris and Arnold were enduring the fact that a winding up order had been made and nothing had happened since the date of the order. So the employees were continuing to run the business. <coughs> and the land, this 20-acre site, could be split into three distinct areas. And here's a slide to illustrate the position. Part belonged to Chris personally, that's around 60%, which would be dealt with by Chris's trustee. Part belonged to the company, but subject to a bank charge, that's around 30% and part was unencumbered and belonged to the company, around 10%. So going back to what the official receiver was telling me, he wasn't sure what the valuation of the property was, he wasn't sure the level of the bank borrowing that was secured on the property. He told me that there were a number of tenants on site that had separate buildings and were conducting independent trades. 
and there weren't any formal agreements with those tenants. And there were lots of scrap vehicles belonging to the company that were all over the site, some in buildings, some in the open. And because the site couldn't be closed off, particularly because of the tenant's right, there were significant security issues on that site. And also, because of the usage of the site, there were issues of contamination. And the bank were considering appointing a receiver. And steps were being taken to appoint me as liquidator, providing I accepted the appointment, and the official receiver wanted a decision that day as there were so many pressing issues. So, no pressure there. I had to make a very quick decision based on the information that I had as to whether I accepted the appointment. And that's where the life of an IP can be very risky. It would probably be at least a couple of weeks before I had a good understanding of all the details. Mm. Just bear with me. So why was it all so important to me? As you may know, the way any liquidation works it is that a liquidator will only get paid from the realisation of the assets, which would be after any costs. And in the case of a compulsory liquidation, that would mean all the official receiver's costs and petitioning creditor costs, plus any expense of the liquidation, would have to be paid before I'd have any chance of recovering my fees from the realisations. And that means that if there are insufficient realisations, not only would it mean my staff and I were working for nothing, but I could also end up personally liable for certain expenses incurred in the liquidation. And from what I could see, there was an unencumbered piece of land belonging to the company, but I hadn't really got a clue of the valuation, let alone whether anybody might be interested in buying it. And I guessed the valuation to be somewhere between 25,000 and 100,000 pounds, but subject to the contamination, which could even render it worthless. And believe me, not an easy decision, but I crossed my fingers and confirmed that the official receiver, with the official receiver, I was prepared to act as liquidator. And just before I continue the story, I'll just explain uh, what the difference is between a compulsory liquidation and the difference between a creditor's voluntary liquidation. That's a, a CVL and a compulsory liquidation. So a CVL, is that's a, credit, a, a creditor's voluntary liquidation, is a director's-driven process. The board resolve the company cannot continue to trade by reason of its liabilities and a meeting of creditors is called. And from the date of the director's meeting to the date of the creditor's meeting, which is the date when the company enters liquidation and the liquidator is appointed, is around 16 to 28 days, depending upon the articles of the company. The court and the official receiver are not involved in this process at all. And a compulsory liquidation is a court-driven process which can be initiated or petitioned by a number of parties. That is... A creditor, as it has been in this particular case, or a member, that's a shareholder, or an administrator or a supervisor of a company voluntary arrangement, a CVA. And typically the time scale for a compulsory liquidation is much longer than it would be for a creditor's voluntary liquidation. And assuming a creditor issues a winding up petition against a company, it's likely to be around six to seven weeks before it's listed to be heard by the court. And at the hearing, the court will issue a winding up petition, a winding up order, unless there are good grounds not to make the order. And once the order has been made, the process is taken over by the official receiver, and if there appears to be assets belonging to the company, the official receiver will look to have an independent insolvency practitioner appointed to deal with the case. And he can do this either through what's called the rota, which is a, a list of local IPs that are prepared to, to take these appointments, or he can make, it, uh, make an appointment following direct consultation with the major creditors, which of course is what he did in this instance, or we could be appointed 
by a formal creditors meeting, but that would take at least another three to four weeks to convene. So, back to the story. And if you recall, I just made the decision to take my life into my own hands and take the appointment. And because of the urgent issues raised by the official receiver, I had no choice but to clear my diary and drive immediately to the site, which is about two hours away in deepest Herefordshire. And there were things that needed to be dealt with straight away. So, I had to dismiss the staff that day and make sure we had contact details to ensure that we could process their entitlements. I had to secure the books and records and agree with the bookkeeper whether she would stay on to bring the records up to date as soon as possible. I needed to secure the office and the site as, 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 temp and as a temporary measure, had to instruct an agent to have 24-hour patrols on the site as we couldn't render it secure. And I needed to collect any cash and other valuables that were on site. And I managed to get away eventually at around 11 o'clock that night, and event that evening, but, but at least I'd managed to do what I wanted to do. And as things worked out, the bookkeeper was very helpful, and we kept her on for a couple of weeks. We went back on site quite a few times over the next few weeks, sorting out the most pressing problems. And the, particularly, uh, the biggest problem was, was with the tenants. And the tenants on site had their electricity supplied from one substation, which was located, would you believe it, on the unencumbered part of the property belonging to the company and therefore my responsibility. And historically, this was being recharged on a monthly basis. But there was no way that the actual usage of the tenants could be monitored, and unbelievably, this had been historically charged by the directors on an estimated basis. And the electricity supply company were owed around about £40,000 by the company and were threatened to cut off the supplies if I didn't sign a personal guarantee to cover electrical supplies from the date of my appointment. And they wanted this done immediately. <coughs> and based on what we could see, the amounts recharged to the various tenants per month was coming into loss per month of around £10,000. So I had to make a difficult, difficult decision. Should I let the power be cut off and risk potential court action from the tenants? Or explain my position to the tenants, request a deposit to be made against the electricity charges and increase the charges, all based on estimated information? Not easy, but that's how we proceeded. Now, as you can imagine, we got a mixed reaction from the tenants and it was far from perfect as far as I was concerned. But ultimately, they knew they had to work with me or face not having a power supply. So I reluctantly signed the personal guarantee, but didn't get that much sleep that night either. <coughs> the water charges were similar, albeit the amounts weren't so much, so that wasn't quite such a problem. Security remained a massive issue. We couldn't just lock the gates because of the tenants, so we had to arrange a permanent 24-hour security presence for the whole site at a huge cost. And despite the help of the bookkeeper, the accounting records were a complete shambles. We needed to make some sense of the records to investigate what had been happening and who the creditors were. And then there was the environmental licence. And the company had this because of the scrap trade. It carried on. We didn't really know what to do with this at all. So we sought legal advice. And one solicitor advised us to disclaim it, another to retain it. And both warned of serious potential problems for me if we got it wrong. A week or so after we were appointed, the bank appointed a receiver to recover the bank's interest. <coughs> and just to break from the story for a few minutes, talk about receivers. So a bank or a point will appoint a receiver when there's been a breach of loan conditions on a mortgage, typically for non-payment. And the company doesn't have to be in liquidation or any insolvency process, so the bank can take this action without reference 
to any other creditors or to the directors, in fact. And what's the difference between an LPA receiver and a fixed charge receiver? An LPA receiver is appointed under the Law of Property Act 1925, and the lender, that's typically the bank, becomes eligible to appoint when the lender can exercise his power of sale, such as on a mortgage default. And under the LPA 1925, an LPA receiver has the power to demand and recover all income, that's typically the rent, but not a sale. So the powers within the Act are relatively limited. <coughs> but the powers of, of an LPA receiver are often supplemented by additional powers included in the legal charge, such as the sale. The fixed charge receiver is appointed directly under the terms of the mortgage deed. There's no reference to a court. This is far more flexible as far as the lender is concerned to appoint under a fixed charge rather than the LPA. And most of the receivers we come across are in fact, in fact fix, fixed charge receivers. So, back to the story. And just to recap, we've got this 20 acre site with myself as liquidator, the trustee, and now a receiver in possession of another part which was charged to the bank. So we called a meeting between myself, the receiver and the trustee to agree how the common issues could be dealt with and particularly the security issues on site and the sharing of costs and the appointment of a marketing agent for the trustee, liquidator and, and receiver to sell the land. We proceeded to jointly instruct a property agent who gave us the first real indication of the value of the property. And, he, and that was approximately £500,000 to the trustee, £400,000 to the receiver and £75,000 to ourselves, a total of around a million pounds. And one of the tenants was actually interested in, in buying the site and the agent took up negotiations with him who made an offer of £950,000 for the full site. This was slightly lower than we'd hoped for, but particularly bear in mind the contamination issue, at least it was a reasonable offer and a big relief to me. The agent called another meeting with the trustee, the receiver and myself. We agreed we'd have full marketing for a relatively short period, about four to six weeks, to see if there was any other interest. And at the same time, hoping we didn't upset the tenant. So the agent got on with it, and within a couple of weeks, the agent identified a further eight parties, interested parties, and the two highest bidding parties were invited to submit their best and final offers, and both parties offered around 1.1 million, so a very worthwhile exercise, but difficult to distinguish the best offer. And we agreed the fairest way to deal with this was that the first potential purchaser to complete the contract would be the winner, a contract race. So draft comp composite contracts were issued to both parties and the race was on. Oh. Thanks, Janet. I hope nobody was uh, of a sensitive disposition. Right, so the race was on. I've never seen anything so complicated. There was one sales contract, three sellers, two alternative buyers, and to complicate matters, the trustee, the receiver and myself all needed to have separate solicitors acting for us because we all had slightly different issues and interests to deal with. And once, the once the race started, I was inundated with calls and emails from my solicitors and the other two joint vendors. It was important of course, that we all work together for the common good. Well, and apologies to any solicitors but I, who are in the room now, and I know there's a few, but I've never seen solicitors work so fast. <laughs> and within a few days, we had completion. Few, I thought. And within a few days of completion, I was mighty relieved to receive from the solicitors the liquidator's share of the proceeds. But before we could pay the costs of the liquidation, these funds had to be banked in the Bank of England, where a 15% Secretary of State fee is applied to all receipts. And effectively, it's a, it's a tax. So that's the exciting bit, I thought so anyway. Um, so what happened next? 
Well, we found out after much inquiry that the bank debt secured under the charge was around £200,000. And once the receiver paid the bank back, his job had come to an end. And as you'll remember, the land with the bank charge on actually belonged to the company, and the liquidator received the proceeds after the receiver had paid his fees and the other expenses, a sum of around £250,000. And so we'd now recovered a substantial amount of, uh, of over £350,000, and it was clear that we should be in a position to pay all of the creditors. And that was easier said than done, given the state of the records. But we did our best to work with the creditors and work out their debt. And all creditors were paid back 100% of their debt, which I don't think was a bad result, even though I say so myself. And Bob actually called me when he got his cheque. I never thought I'd get, get my money back, he said. And to say he was pleased was a bit of an understatement, believe me. OK, so what happened to Chris Bev and Arnold, eh? The last I heard, Chris, the last I heard, Chris was trying to sue the trustee and Arnold had complained that I'd pocketed the cash, the petty cash on the site that first day I'd turned up. Just for the avoidance of doubt, I'd like to make it put on the record and make it absolutely clear that I didn't actually pocket the cash. So is there a moral to the story? Well, if Chris, Bev and Arnold had sought advice when the warning side started, things could have worked out so differently and they may still have their business or at least a value for it. And what are the warning signs? Those are the signs that people who run companies and advisors to and advisors to business you should be aware of. Things like checks bouncing, overdrafts operating at the limit or going above the limit on a regular basis, not paying suppliers on time, arrears of PAYE and VAT, that sort of thing. But could things really have been different for Chris and Bev and Arnold? Well, I'd say so. If only they'd taken advice instead of burying their heads. The fact that the creditors were paid in full meant that the value of the assets exceeded the liabilities. Even if the business were in, was incurring losses, which it almost certainly was, it would have been quite possible to have a solvent liquidation or another procedure where Chris, Bevan and Arnold minimised professional fees and maximised the return they would get. And instead, they received nothing for the business and the professional fees and costs came to at least £350,000. Not all mine, I hasten to add. So, what have we covered in today's talk? We've looked at the difference between a creditor's voluntary liquidation and a compulsory liquidation. We've looked at the circumstances a receiver is appointed and the differences between an LPA receiver and a fixed charge receiver. And we've looked at some of the practical issues that a liquidator deals with when he's doing his job and the risks he has to take. And we've seen how the creditors on this case have been fully paid and the difference it's made to Bob and how it's so important for directors to seek advice as soon as they see any financial warning signs. Insolvency is an area that most professionals don't deal with on a regular basis. It's so important to know who you can contact and get some specialist advice at the right time and plan together. So, so what do I want you to do? Well, have a think. Do you know a Bob out there? Or do you know a Chris or a Bev or an Arnold that are putting their head in the sand? Do you know anyone like this whose issues like we've looked at today or you think we might be able to help? If you do, please speak to me or one of my colleagues. We're always pleased to have a chat or a meeting without charge to explore options and I'm sure we can help. What we're trying to avoid is a formal insolvency situation but the next best thing is a structured, planned insolvency process of which the director or the individual 
can retain a good element of control. Okay, and just before I conclude, I'd like to ask my colleagues at Griffin and King just to stand up and make themselves known. And, uh, okay, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, uh, Blakey. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, and uh, over to uh, Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please put your hands together and extend a very warm welcome to Amazon bestseller, Charlie Hutton. Oh. Thank you. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Hutton, and this morning I'm going to show you exactly what these nuns with guns have got to do with helping you legally murder your competitors online. But before we get into all that good stuff, whenever I'm in your guy's position, especially after we've loaded up on lunch, I'm sort of sat there, I'm thinking to myself, you know what, do I really want to listen to this guy? Or should I break my phone out of my pocket, perhaps see what's been happening on the email and possibly send a few tweets on Twitter? So to answer that question for you this morning, I'm going to make you a very quick promise. If you keep your phones in your pocket, if you suck it up, if you pay attention, if you listen for the next 17 minutes or so, you're going to leave this session this morning with a mapped out online lead generation system for your business, something you can implement in the next seven to 10 days. Does that sound good? Say yes, Charlie, it lets me know that you're awake and you're paying attention. Does that sound good? Fantastic. So before we get into all that good stuff, I'm going to tell you a very quick story. It's a story that I'm kind of embarrassed to tell, but one that you ultimately need to hear because it's going to help you make the shift in your mindset from that of the mediocre majority to the entrepreneurial elite. Now, this story starts in September last year in a small town just outside New York City, a place called Groton in Connecticut. You see, I was out in Groton, Connecticut, delivering a keynote speech in front of around 1,000 or so direct marketers. And after I got off my 10-hour flight, I'd landed at the high-end Hilton Hotel that they put me up in. I'm unpacking my stuff, ready to get on stage the next day, and I come to the slow realization that I'd forgotten the collar stays, or the collar stiffeners for my shirt. Now, for those of you that don't know what collar stays or collar stiffeners are, they're pretty much a small magnetic clip that you put inside the collar of your shirt so that when you're on stage, especially in front of a big audience like that, you look super pristine and, and you look the part. As you can imagine, on this sort of thing, this was a pretty big deal for me. So I run down to the gift shop at this high-end Hilton hotel. They haven't got any there. My next port of call was a nice young lady at reception. And I say, look, can you do me a massive favor? Can you point me in the direction of the best men's wear store that Groton, Connecticut has to offer? And she says, no problem at all, sir. All you need to do is head out the big glass doors, take a left down Main Street, take your first right, and you'll be at the best men's wear store Groton, Connecticut has to offer. It's called the Walmart. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, not the answer that I was expecting, but when in Rome. So I jump into the hire car and I head down to the best menswear store that Groton, Connecticut has to offer, where apparently you can buy a three-piece tailor-made suit for less than 50 bucks, but you can't get a single set of these collar stays. So after about two more hours of driving around, I end up at what the Americans call a Kmart. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever been to a Kmart in the US before, but it's pretty much the UK equivalent of a TK Maxx. So by the time I end up at this Kmart, I've been driving around for two hours, I'm tired, I'm pissed off, and I can't believe that I'm in a town so bumpkin-y that I can't even get a set of these collar stays for my shirt. And in that sort of language, I say to the poor young lady that's stuck in the shelves, I say, look, I'm a really important person. I'm a two times best-selling author. I've got this big speaking engagement tomorrow in front of a thousand or so people. Surely somewhere in this store, you must have a single set of these collar stays. And she looks at me square in the eyes and addresses me in probably the tone of voice that I would speak to my two-year-old and she says, no, sir, I'm afraid we don't. She then says, but, sir, we do have men's dress shirts with freshly pressed, super stiff collars. You could just buy a new shirt, sir. You see, that was the obvious answer. I spent the last two hours driving around like a headless chicken when all I needed to do was buy a new shirt. And it's exactly the same when it comes to marketing our businesses online. You see, when it comes to marketing our businesses online, we chase the wrong things. We chase what I call new metrics. So we're constantly being told that we need to look at things like likes, friends, CPC, PPC, hits, and all this other stuff which doesn't actually generate a revenue at the end of the month. And while we're on this topic, can I get a quick show of hands? Does everyone know what I mean when I say the term hits, website hits? Yeah, show of hands, perfect. So you guys know that HIT stands for How Idiots Track Success. Now, I'm only joking, but the reason I say that is when it comes to marketing your business online, 
I can't stand any uncertainty for any sort of advertising spend. In my eyes, if you are spending a pound on your advertising online, that should be generating at least a pound on return in the back of your business. The trouble we have when it comes to marketing any sort of business online, as business owners, we sort of have a diminished expectation for the results. We sort of say to ourselves, hey, you know what, everyone's doing this internet thing. We should probably do it. But you know what, if we don't get a huge response, then that's okay. But if the phone rings a couple of times, then hey, that's good with me. And the reason we don't get the response, the reason we don't get the response that we want online is because not every single person that hits our website is ready or able to make a purchasing decision today. Let me say that again. Not every single person that hits your website is ready or able to make a purchasing decision today. It comes down to what we call a timing issue. And in order to demonstrate this timing issue, what I'd like to do this morning is take a very quick poll of the room. Can I get a show of hands, please, for the amount of husbands that we've got in the room this morning? I was going to say loving husbands, but I think we'll stick with husbands this morning. So we've got quite a few of you guys. So let's take you guys and let's add you to a big pool of 1,000 loving husbands. How many of these 1,000 loving husbands do you think woke up this Wednesday morning, rolled over, looked at their wife and thought, you know what, my wife is awesome. I must take my wife out to dinner this evening. Probably two, three, maybe five out of those 1,000 husbands. Now let's ask ourselves this question. Out of those same devoted 1,000 loving husbands, how many of them do you think will wake up just one morning in the next four weeks, roll over, look at the wife and go, you know what, sweetheart, you cooked an awesome dinner last night. I'll tell you what, let's go out for tea this evening. 20, 30, 50 at a push in the next four weeks? Now let's ask ourselves this question. Out of those same devoted 1,000 loving husbands, how many of them do you think will wake up just one morning, one morning in the next 12 months and say, shit, I'm in the doghouse. I really must take my wife out to dinner this evening. Probably nearly all of them, right? Because it comes down to what we call a timing issue. And when it comes to marketing your business online, we solve this timing issue with what we call a secondary reason for response. Now, secondary reason for response says this. Our online marketing, our collateral, has not one reason for people to respond, it has two. The first reason, or the primary reason, is for those people that are ready and able to buy today. They're our prime candidates, if you will. But we also need to have a secondary reason too. A reason for those people that aren't quite ready to buy today, but might be ready to buy in four weeks, 12 months time, we need to have a reason for those people to leave their contact information with us. A reason for those people to leave their contact information with us so that we can start talking to them, they can start getting to know us, we can start building an epic amount of trust and goodwill with them so that when they are ready to buy, they will only want to choose us as a business. Does that make sense? Say yes, Charlie. Let's pretend for a moment we came here voluntarily this morning. <laughs> so this is how we do this. And when it comes to marketing our business online, we do that with what we call a, a lead magnet. Now, a lead magnet is something that you guys can create completely free of charge. You can concoct it out of thin air, but it needs to be something that's a perceived informational value to your prospect, your customer. So it could be a report, a white paper, a how-to guide, some sort of tips or tricks or whatever it might be, but something that your visitor to your online marketing will leave their contact information in exchange for. So as an example, let's take James. Now James is a new PR manager for IT firm iCloud Solutions. And James, in his new role as PR manager, has been tasked with putting on their next annual customer appreciation event. Now the trouble is James has got six months three weeks, four days, and 32 minutes until the directors that gave him his job find out if the customer appreciation event that he is planning lives up to last year's runaway success that was a booze-fueled sex romp that would put Charlie Sheen to shame. Now, James is out there today doing the first day of research looking for a venue, and he comes across this awesome venue that we're at today here at the Village Hotel. What are the chances on day one of research that James is going to book this venue for his conference in six months' time? Slim to none, right? But what are the chances? If James is on the village's website and he sees a big shiny button that says download our free guide, the 27 things that you must do in order to throw the best customer appreciation event that your business has ever seen, what are the chances he's going to leave his contact information then? Extremely high, right? Because it helps him solve a problem. And that's exactly what a lead magnet is there to do. It is there to help people solve their problems. And of course, once James has left his contact information with the village hotel, well, what can we do? We can start talking to him. He can start getting to know us. We can start getting to know him. We can start building some epic amounts of goodwill so that when he is ready to book that venue, we are the only venue that he wants to choose. You see, what lead magnets allow you to do is lead magnets allow you to build a list of future customers. Lead magnets ultimately help you get off that income roller coaster and actually iron out that curve because you can start building a list of people that aren't quite ready to buy today but will be ready to buy in the future. 
Does that make sense? Can you guys see how lead magnets can start making acquiring customers that much simpler? Yes, Charlie? Yeah. Fantastic. So with all that being said, in order to take a lead magnet and start turning that into sales on demand, we need to plug this into some sort of system. And it's what we call a three-step conversion system. Now, a three-step conversion system by its nature has three steps. Step one is a small amount of targeted traffic. And the two key words there, guys, are small and targeted. And that's where you can get your biggest leverage online. Step number two is what we call a capture mechanism or a conversion funnel. And this is an absolute game changer for you guys in the room today. And step number three is follow-up. It's pointless collecting all this information and we don't actually do anything with it. I'm going to run through all three of these steps this morning in the limited time that we've got together. So let's dive right in. Targeted traffic, step number one. Now when it comes to targeted marketing, there's pretty much three ways in which you can skin a cat. The first and the most popular way is where you take a big A to Z road planner, I think they still exist, you lay them out on a boardroom table, you take a styrofoam cup, you turn that cup over your business, you take a red Sharpie pen, you draw around that cup, take the cup away, shade in the area, and you say, that's my target market. In other words, it's a radius around your business on what we call geographical targeting. Good method, but what I want to do today is show you how it can be a lot more sophisticated with the way that you start targeting your customers online. And to do that, I'm going to share with you a quick story. About 18 months ago, my mobile phone rings. And just to sort of set the scene here, guys, I very rarely, if ever, take an unscheduled call on my mobile phone. But for whatever reason, this guy gets through to me today. And he says, look, you know what, Charlie? I've seen you speak a couple of times. We're currently running ads on the internet at the moment, but we're getting zero response. So I start talking to this guy. And it turns out this guy's called Ollie. And he runs probably one of the UK's largest concierge services. And what they do is they specialize in helping high net worth business owners to manage their international travel. So I say to Ollie, these ads that you're currently running on the internet, tell me about them. Who are you targeting? He says, well, we're sort of targeting people that live in a 25 mile radius of London. Because that's where our head office is. So it means that we can get out and see people and they come and see us, which sort of made sense. So I then say to Ollie, tell me about these people that live in a 25 mile radius of London. And he said, well, they like living in the city and they're white collar, which I kind of figured. But what I was trying to do was, I was trying to get Ollie to dive into what we call psychogeographics and psychodemographics, which are two very, very big words and one simple concept. And the concept is this, online privacy is dead. Absolutely terrible news for anyone in the room that is interested in keeping their stuff private. But if there is anyone in this room that is interested in making more sales, generating more profit and getting more revenue, this is the best news that you could have had today. Because if you said to me, Charlie, my ideal customer is a female member of the clergy that campaigns for gun rights and goes to the local Odeon cinema every single Wednesday night to watch reruns of 1980s Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, I'm pretty sure we could start finding that customer online. We could start showing ads to those exact demographics within the next 17 minutes or less. You just need to know how and where to find them. So if we were to take Ollie and his concierge business, how could we start being a little bit more sophisticated about the people that he was targeting? Well, we probably still only want to target those people that lived in a 25 mile radius of London. Their main customers were males, so we probably only want to target males. Probably only those males that were aged, I don't know, between 35 and 60. And probably those males that were, I don't know, frequent international travelers as well, because they're a concierge service. Those are the sort of people that they want to target. And like I said, this information is readily available. You just need to know how and where to look for it. And to prove that point, this next slide is taken directly out of Facebook's advertising manager. You see, within the next seven minutes or less, we could reach 12,011 people that were male that lived in the United Kingdom, that lived in a 25 male radius of London, that were aged between 35 and 60, and were international travelers. And we could reach those people for less than 37 pence a click. How cool is that? You see, what it allows us to do is, if we can start targeting based on demographics, it means that we can start cloning our ideal customer. As long as we know who our ideal customer is, we can go out and we can stop wasting our spend on people that might not reach our audience. Does that make sense? So, so far, we know a couple of things. First of all, we know that we need to have a secondary reason for response, and that comes in the form of a lead magnet. That's right, come on guys, stay awake. We then know that we need to have our three-step conversion system, step one of which consists of a small amount of targeted traffic, and that is going to help us clone our ideal customer. The next question we then have is with this small amount of targeted traffic, where do we actually want to send these people? Well, we don't want to send them to the homepage of our website. 
We don't want to send them to an inner page of our website. We don't want to send them to any of our social media profiles. You see, where we want to send these people to is to what we call a capture system or a conversion funnel. And the first part of our conversion funnel is super, super simple. We send them to a page which looks like this. Very, very plain looking page. Minimal company branding, no links going elsewhere. And this page has one goal and one goal only. The goal of this page is to capture the names and the email addresses of as many people as possible that land on it. And this page does this by selling the visitor on why they should download or request your lead magnet. And the key word there, guys, is the word sell, because even though we're giving away something online, giving it away for free, we have less than about two seconds to capture someone's interest and capture someone's attention. So we need to sell them on the benefits of how this is going to help them solve their problems and why they should be leaving their contact information with us. Now, you guys might be sat there thinking, you know what, Charlie, this isn't rocket science. We see this happen all the time. In fact, we've got something on our website which captures people's names and email addresses. The trouble is, the majority of businesses, when they do this sort of thing, is they then send someone to a thank you page, and that thank you page says, awesome decision, we've just sent you an email with your guide or your report attached. Now, what I recommend you do, what I recommend my private clients do, and what I recommend my international corporate clients do, is we send them to step two, of our conversion funnel, because at step two of our conversion funnel, what we do is we ask for their full contact information. We ask for a full address, we ask for a telephone number, and we ask them some sort of qualification question. We say something along the lines of, hey, great decision on requesting your lead magnet. What I'd love to do, what I'd really love to do is send you out a free physical copy in the post. Something you can scribble some notes on, something you can share around the office, something that you can really digest. And in order to send that out, I just need you to tell me where to send it, and what I do is I make sure it gets rushed out to you in the post today, first class. Do you know what will happen? 70 to 80% of people that landed or completed step number one will complete this step number two too. And the difference between someone that completes step number one and step number two, someone that completes step number two is infinitely more qualified than someone that's just gonna give you their name and email address. So straight away we are starting to sift and qualify our leads as they are coming into our funnels. So we know the people we want to talk to. The second thing to note about this is, of course if someone completes step number two, we're not doing like everyone else in the marketplace is doing and just following up via email. Because what we can start doing now is we can start using mixed media. We can start sending them stuff in the post. We can start communicating with them via text message. We can even, God forbid, pick up and have a conversation with someone over the telephone. But step number two allows us to do that. Now, is this all making sense so far? Yes, yes Charlie, fantastic. Now, if someone completes step number two, we're still not done with them here. If someone completes step number two, we then send them to step number three. And at step number three, what we do is we ask them to complete our primary reason for response. So if that is to request a callback, this is where we ask for it. If that's to book at a consultation, this is where we ask for it. If this is where we want them to actually buy something, we ask them for it at this step here. Because what we've done now is we've got someone to complete what we call two micro-commitments. Micro-commitment number one was to leave their name and email address. Micro-commitment number two was leave their full contact information. So by the time to get to step number three, human psychology kicks in. As human beings, we love to complete what we've finished. So we've got them two steps down the rabbit hole onto completing this thing. So even if at step number one they had no interest whatsoever of completing your primary reason for response, by the time they get to step number three, they will be infinitely more qualified to do it. Does that make sense? Can you guys see how that works? Perfect. So with that being said, this morning we've covered a couple of things. We know that we need to have a secondary reason for response, and that comes in the form of a lead magnet. And we then know that we need to have this three-step conversion system. Step number one, where we have a small amount of targeted traffic that maps our ideal customer. Step number two is where we put them through this conversion funnel. And then the next question we need to ask ourselves, what the hell do we do with these people once we've got their contact information? And that is an extremely simple answer. Because what we need to do is we need to make sure that we follow up. It's pointless collecting this information if we don't actually have a system or a process for following these people up. And the way that I talk about following or doing follow-up is probably ever so slightly different that you might have seen or you might have heard of before. In order to demonstrate this, I'm going to share with you my last and final story of the day. You see, <coughs> going back probably about almost three years ago now, I'm coming down the stairs in my house, and at the bottom of the stairs in my house, we've got a front door. So any post that comes through the door, you can see as soon as you're coming down the stairs. And on this Thursday morning, I pick up this envelope, I open it, and I've got this letter from a nice young lady called Stephanie. And Stephanie works in the accounts department at Wonga. Dot com. Has everyone heard of the payday loan company, Wonga? Fantastic. So Stephanie is writing to me, and the letter goes something like this. Dear Mr. Hutton, you recently borrowed £21,584 from us. You have not paid us back. We now would like our money, please. 
Now, the trouble with this letter was I had not actually borrowed any money from Wonga. Someone had stolen my identity, taken out this loan in my place, and now Wonga were hunting me down for the cash. For most people, this would be a massive pain in the ass. For me, the ever optimist, I was like, this is awesome. I am going to get to see firsthand how Wonga managed to extract money out of people that have no money. Imagine if you could take their principle and apply it to businesses that actually sold something of value and had some people that might actually want to take them up on the offer. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through the process that Wonga used to extract this money out of no money, because I'm pretty sure anyone ever borrowed more than 20 grand from Wonga and not paid them back? <laughs> Didn't think so. So I'm going to walk you through this process now. It's very, very simple. You see, what Wonga happens is you go onto their website, you fill out their nice sliders, you borrow said money from them, you don't pay them back, and then Stephanie gets on your case. And she pretty much goes like this. She sends you a first notice, a second notice, a third notice, a fourth notice, a fifth notice. I got all the way up to notice number seven until my fraud got sorted out. I'm pretty sure Stephanie will keep hunting you down until you pay back or until you die. There's a couple of things to note about these notices that come out from Wonga. First of all, there's minimal, minimal branding on all of their communications. Everything looks like it's come direct and personally from Stephanie. So they're using Stephanie to build a relationship with me. Thing number two to note about the communication, they are always building epic amount of goodwill. By the time I got the third piece of correspondence, I genuinely thought that Stephanie cared about my so-called financial hardship. <laughs> By the time I got correspondence number seven, I felt compelled to send them some money. It was unbelievable. Stephanie, she was giving me guides, she was giving me calculators, she was giving me the best financial advice that I had ever had, and I've got a pretty good financial advisor. She was giving me all this information, building this epic amount of goodwill so that I felt compelled to give her some cash. And the third and the final thing to note about these correspondents, they used mixed media. They didn't just use email. They didn't just use letters. They didn't just use the telephone. They used all three. So if you are looking to get the response that you want out of your follow-up, especially from a digital perspective, don't do what everyone else does. Don't send one crummy designed HTML email which has got your logo at the top. If you want the secret of response from your digital marketing, especially email follow-up, you need to make sure that it's multiple step. So that's sending multiple sequences or multiple emails as part of a campaign. Those emails need to make and look like they've come from a real human being. And last and by no means least, if possible, if you have got their contact information, you need to make sure that you are selling or sending related stuff to these people out in the post. That is the only way to make this sort of follow-up work. Otherwise, you just mix into the same blend of everyone else that is doing this sort of thing. Is that making sense so far? Everyone understand that? So, in summary, to legally murder your competitors online, we need a few things. First of all, we need this understanding of secondary reason for response, which comes in the form of a lead magnet. That's right. Thing number two, in order to get these generate these sales on demand, we need our three-step conversion system. Step number one is a small amount of targeted traffic. That's right which is ideally made up of our ideal customer. Step number two is we need a conversion system where first of all, we're gonna capture someone's name and email address. We are then going to capture their full contact information and then finally, we're gonna ask them to complete our primary reason to response once we've got them to complete these two micro commitments. And then last and by no means least, we're gonna have a follow-up system in place too. And this follow-up system needs to do three things. First of all, it needs to be multi-step. That means not just one piece of communication. Second of all, it needs to build an epic amount of trust and goodwill by making sure it's sent or looks like it's been sent from a real human being. Don't kid for a moment that Stephanie is a real person. She's probably someone that's completely made up. You can make up people too, or perhaps of automated stuff that goes out from your individuals in your company. And thing number three, if possible, we need to make sure that it's going over multiple medias. So that's not just relying on email. That's making sure we're using good old-fashioned direct mail and the telephone too. Is that all clear? Fantastic. So with all that being clear, there's a couple of problems with everything that we talked about this morning. Because you see over here, we have all these new ideas and new information and the good intentions that you guys are going to leave this room with today. And over here, we have the actual implementation of that stuff. And in the middle, we have this great big gap between new ideas, new information, good intentions, and the actual implementation. And the problem with that is, 48 hours from now, you will have forgotten half of everything that I've told you. Even more worryingly than that, 16 days from now, you won't even remember being in this room, let alone remember what my name is. <laughs> and to be fair to a few of you guys, I have seen some of you taking notes. And as an avid note taker myself, let's be honest with each other, note taker to note taker, we all have that place. For me, it's a passenger seat of my car. 
for you. It could be the in tray in your desk office. It could be under the kids' bunk bed. But as note takers, we all have that place where notes from seminars, conferences, and exhibitions like today go to gather dust, never to be seen again. And if I'm honest with you, notes aren't really any way to sort of like bridge that gap from new ideas, new information, good intentions, and the actual implementation of this thing. So in order to help you bridge that gap, I've got a couple of things for you today. First of all, number one, in your goodie bag, which is outside, there is a copy of my new best-selling book called The Business Owner's Guide to Making Out Like a Bandit. And in there, we talk around things like lead magnets and the other bits and pieces to help you guys stay on track once you've left this room today. The second thing that we have, option number two, is for those people that have liked what you've learned today. Because if you've liked what you've learned today, and you sat there and you said, you know what, maybe, maybe there is something here that we could use in our business. Maybe there is just one thing that Charlie has said today that we could use to start generating some more leads and more qualified customers for our company. Because if you said maybe this morning, what I would like to do is I would like to help you map out and implement and apply this whole thing to your guys' business. Ultimately give you sort of like a fast track, bespoke blueprint guide as to how this system could be applied to you and what you guys do. Now with that being said, this sort of option number two, it's not for everybody. It is definitely not for people that are looking for an implement in five minutes or a quick fix type solution. But if you are the sort of business or you are the sort of the business owner that believes in yourself, is willing to make changes and take action on the recommendations that we make, you could turn slow sales months into record second quarters. And to set the bar here, guys, I've got a corporate client at the moment out in Guitar and he's paying me 1,200 pounds an hour to talk him through and implement this thing, literally, so he can stop banging his head against the wall. But because you guys are in this room this morning, because the guys at Griffin and King have done an absolutely awesome deal for you, you can get this mapped out for your business. You can spend an hour with me on the phone for absolutely nothing. Completely free of charge. However, there is a slight caveat. There are only five spots available on this offer, and this offer is by application only. The reason it's by application only is simply because my time is precious to me. I want to make sure that I am only talking to businesses and business owners that are serious about making changes that I recommend. The reason why is because I've got a two-year-old son called Barney. He's absolutely awesome, and I love spending time with him. So any time that I take away on the phone speaking to business owners like yourselves means that I'm sacrificing time with him. So if you would like to spend an hour with me on the phone completely free of charge, all you need to do over on that table there is a series of application forms. Fill in that application form, put it in the black box, and then what will happen is Emma at my office, she will go through each of these applications, she will review it uh, one by one. If you are successful, we hopefully will chat together on a phone for an hour. If you're not successful, she will let you know as well. So if you would like to invest in yourself or your business, simply complete the form, put it in the box, um, and we can go to there. And this offer will expire in the next 10 minutes. So that just leaves me to say thank you ever so much for listening to me this morning. I don't know if we've still got time for questions, Janet, or if, if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to take those now. Does Emma really exist? Does what, sorry? Does Emma really yeah, Emma is a real person. She's my wife. <laughs> Although not every single email that you get from Emma will be necessarily a real email. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep you guessing. That would have been genius. Or toothpicks, someone said in the past as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm. How, how, how it's to be honest, it's a lot easier than you would probably think. A lot of the software and the tools out there now are designed for people with probably minimum technical expertise. Emma, my wife, prime example, she's got no idea how technical stuff types works, but she can get in and she can set up a follow-up sequence with some of the tools that are available in probably under 10 minutes. The hardest part normally is actually coming up with the content and actually writing the stuff that you want to send. The actual implementation of this stuff is normally the easiest part. Any other questions? Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for uh, listening. <coughs>
is these I can add it yeah. mm. so he yeah so we uh, he goes by <laughs> Well, I, 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 can rec I can recommend getting names on cards that would be for me or anybody out there. The next one is uh, Joanne Baldwin, who's an audit partner in Ormerod Rutter. Well done, Joanne. Congratulations. Yep, yep, come on forward. Finally, thank you to the sound and film crew, photographer, village and hotel staff, and obviously, finally, thank you all for attending, because if you weren't here today, we couldn't hold this event. Uh, we have got a goodie bag for everybody as you leave. Please collect one, but also, more importantly, please hand your badges in. Do not feel you have to rush off. There is food out there. Feel free to carry on networking. Thank you very much. First of all, introduce yourself and your position, your organisation. Okay, my name's Nick Plant, I'm a Chartered Surveyor, Director of SPA Chartered Surveyors in Warsaw. Okay, um, so where, where are we today? What, what have we been up to? Uh, we're at the Village Hotel with the Griffin and King Annual Conference um, Insolvency. Great, and um, what, um, what's been some of the content provided today? The content provided was Tim Caulfield giving a talk on insolvency practitioners, LPA receivers, fixed charge receivers, which we found quite relevant because as chartered surveyors it relates to some of the things that we've come across in our own business. So both myself and my business partner were eager to listen to some of what Tim had to say. Great thought. And, um, and Tim owes me for this as well. Uh, what is your connection to Griffin and King? Uh, my connection to Griffin and King, I've known Tim and his team for probably six, seven years now. We're both Warsaw Town Centre um, located businesses. We're both keen to promote Warsaw business. You know, what goes on in Warsaw should be done by Warsaw people. Um, but also we're both within the same business sphere, so commercial property consultants, which we are. Tim deals with a lot of commercial property through his insolvency practicing. Um, Tim's very good. I, I'm, I'm friends with Tim as well. We both support Wolverhampton Wanderers, for better or for worse. Um, both of us will offer free advice where we ask. Tim rings me for off-the-cuff advice. I ring him for off-the-cuff professional advice. Um, and we have quite a, a, a nice working and, um, and business relationship. And finally, um, would you, and if so, um, who to uh, recommend a day like today? I would recommend a day like today to other firms of surveyors, accountants, solicitors who deal with, from my point of view, property, because whilst these kind of things don't come up too often, what you tend to learn, you can put into practical sense and actually relate it to what's happening with the files on your desks and hopefully deal with things a bit more professionally with your clients. Excellent. Uh, so first of all, Cathy, just introduce yourself, your company, your position. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name's Kathleen Tedstone. Uh, the company I own is HBFS Equity Release Limited. And we advise clients over the age of 55 on how potentially they could raise funds out of the property that they live in. Great stuff. So, um, where are we today? What, what have we been up to? Okay, today I've attended the uh, Griffin and King um, seminar uh, with a view that I was invited along just to learn more about what Griffin and King do as a company, but also with a view of finding out information on um, marketing, uh, which Charlie Dustin has done today. So, just, just go into a little bit more detail on the actual content today. Okay, uh, well obviously Griffin and King are insolvency practitioners um, and and they've given us a case study really of um, a family business that was run whereby they've given useful information and feedback and, and helped that company. Um, following that, Charlie's obviously done his marketing scenario and, and given some free advice on how best to use marketing material and how to get lead generation in. 
great stuff. And uh, what what's your connection? Okay, uh, my connection is I attended uh, a seminar uh, with Griffin and King several years ago. Found it really useful in respect of because of the clients I see. Um, although they may be over 55, 60, some of my clients may actually deal with debt management and therefore may need debt management advice. Equity release isn't always the best advice for them to go down. So having somebody like Griffin and King to refer either businesses to or personal clients to um, just helps me in respect of helping my clients. And finally, um, would you, and if so, uh, recommend, and who, who to, what, what type of person would you recommend this particular event to? Okay, uh, in respect of recommending this type of event, I would say um, all business owners, because I think it gives a practical advice on if you as a business get into difficulty. Um, I think also from solicitors and accountants point of view, you've got business clients who may need uh, financial help before they get into difficulty, and therefore Griffin and King can help them in the future. In respect of my own client, as I said before, some of my clients may be retired but have debt issues. They may have businesses or clients who have business, so therefore um, business owners generally need to come here and, and just get the best advice really. Great stuff. And one one final thought was just on, just on the networking. How yeah. how good is the networking? Okay, um, I'm not the best network networker in respect of coming out to these events. However, um, with the information that Griffin and King give to us um, as individuals, it, it gives us a chance to open network with people, catch up with people that we may not have um, been in business or seen for a while, and, and just generally it is good. And the fact that they have so many attendees that attend. Um, um, you know, a chance of networking with over 100 businesses here today. So, excellent time. Great, thanks okay, so much. That's all right. That. Thanks for that's your time. Cheers. Okay, Ray. So, first of all, just introduce yourself. Um, My your position, your company. My name's Ray White. I'm the finance and casework manager at Warsaw Citizens Advice Bureau. That's great. And um, just tell us where we are today, Ray, and what, what everyone's been up to. Well, at the Village Hotel today, um, Griffin and King have run a small seminar talking about uh, corporate insolvency and liquidation of business. And uh, just elaborate a little bit more on the content itself. Well, for me personally, I deal with personal insolvency and have done for many, many years. We built a very good working relationship with Griffin and King. So we assist clients with personal debt. Today we've been talking about business debt, limited companies, and liquidation of those businesses. From my perspective, as an agency working closely with them, it's useful for me because I now know where to refer people to, and the kind of issues that Griffin and King are faced with when dealing with company liquidation. It's an area I've not touched on, certainly for many, many years. It's a bit of a refresher for me, and it's good for me to be able to see Tim sell what they do to the people in the room. Excellent answer. And um, what about the um, things like the networking and the venue and the food and things like that, right? I'm always, good, always up for a free, free a bit, of, bit of nosh. <laughs> you can't get away from a nice lunch, can you? But that's part and parcel of it. It's nice to see people in the room today that I've seen you know, many, many years ago. I've met solicitors I've not come into contact with for sort of 10, 15 years. So just to touch base with them and find out what they're doing and why they're here today is helpful. I've made contacts today in relation to family lawyers, uh, people who deal with litigation, who I might be able to refer our clients to in the future. Excellent answer. And finally, Ray, uh, would you recommend, and if so, who to uh, an event like today? I think anybody who's dealing with clients who've got financial problems should come along and hear what Griffin and King, as an insolvency practitioner, does. As Tim Caulfield said during his sort of briefing to us all, the worst thing people can do is bury their heads in the sands and leave it and leave it and leave it because at the end of the day, they can lose their business as a consequence. Quite often with personal debt clients, they, they're in the same situation. They only come to you at the last minute and sometimes it's all too late and you can't do a great deal for them. It's far better if people come earlier. You've then got a chance of saving their business. Perhaps not just their business, it could be their home because they may have their home secured against their business borrowing. So my advice is don't leave it too late. Pick that phone up and make that initial contact. 
it may be very hard to do that, but that first step is often the building brick for the future. Great stuff, Ray. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks for your time. So first of all, just introduce yourself, where you're from, your position. Hi, uh, my name's John Stigliano. Uh, my business is Actual People Development, which is a training and development consultancy, and I'm based in Sutton Coalfield. Great stuff. So just tell me uh, where we are today and what everyone's been up to. Um, we're at the Village Hotel for Griffin and King's uh, annual uh, presentation, which is re really interesting every year. Tim does a, a great job talking about um, some of his projects that he works on and we usually have another really good speaker as well. So just just elaborate a little bit more on today's content. Uh, Tim talked to us about the different sorts of insolvency, talked about a particular project that he work on, worked on and the the difficulties that a, a, an IP or an insolvency practitioner has and all the risks that they have to take that perhaps we're oblivious to. And. Um, the network in itself and the, the venue, the yep. food. Yep, um, great venue, food was lovely. Um, loads of people here, which is obviously uh, great if you're a networker. Um, looking to meet different people from different spheres of, of business. And so with, with an event like today, um, who, who would you uh, suggest would be a, you know, the ideal sort of audience member and, and would you recommend it to any, any of your contacts? Yeah, I, mean, I think the obvious people, particularly for people like Tim are uh, accountants, lawyers, uh, professionals I suppose you would you would you would um, wrap it up in, around that banner I suppose yeah so I would recommend it to any accountant or lawyer who um, you know who, who wanted to come to such an event perfect thank you